Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy, and here I am on a quiet corner of a beach. I thought I'd just come out here and do the video from a slightly more exotic looking location than what I have done um, recently. It is the 24th of August, 2024 as I speak, and um, it's actually quite nice to be out in this far corner of the world, away from the far north, you know? <laughs> And, uh, oh, so it's uh, it's nice and peaceful here, but um, yeah, today I want to talk about a number of things. Uh, probably going to be controversial topics, so I have to. Um, what was it? I have to do. I have to tell His Majesty's International um, Extradition Fuzz while I'm out here that everything, speech-wise, that I do in my video is not motivated by hate. No, there's a little bit of love in there, but there's also a little bit of um, comedy, sarcastic irreverence too. And of course, the only thing I'm inciting is silliness and humour. There you go. Right, so what I'd like to talk about today uh, is a number of subjects. I'm going to start with something uh, a little bit on the serious side. What do I think the fallout will be from Keir Starmer's actions, what he has done in the uh, last, uh, I don't know, was it four to six weeks of his uh, premiership, um, which came about by apathy. What do I think he's going to do? Or what do I think what he's going to do? But what do I think are the unintended consequences and the fallout of this? I think there's a number of things that uh, we really got to look out for. One of the things that I have noticed, now from my own personal perspective, seeing as I am of a fully Irish background who grew up in England, um, it did warm my heart when I saw a couple of blokes, one with a tricolour Irish flag and one with a flag of Northern Ireland. And I saw another picture with another one with a tricolour and another one with a Union Jack united. The only downside to all of this is that Keir Starmer has decided to write off everyone that he doesn't like as racist. I mean, it's just broad brush, sweeping generalisation, which of course I don't agree with. And the reason why I don't agree with this is because um, I come from the working classes myself. We are a diverse bunch of people, and some of us speak very well, thank you very much. And we, um, you know, that's the thing. We're not all people who are uh, gammon. We're not all people who are low IQ, low information. We're not all thugs, and we're not uh, all what you'd call barely civilized, no. And this broad brush that gets swept out like that, like that, is just, really gets my goat for one reason and one reason only. And that is, as I've said in many of my videos before, I remember 35 years ago, possibly even 40 years ago, what the far right of that era was like when they had political backing and they actually had some political influence and they actually had some political parties. And they don't. Now you just have a disparate group of people who are politically homeless, the only downside of all of this is that the division that is being stoked up in the UK could actually make what you would call uh, far-right sentiment even worse. I, I, to be honest, I do not consider um, Keir Starmer to be entirely innocent of this. And so what I think is going to be a fallout of what's going on, a lot of people are referring to the people who are fast-tracked to prisoners as political prisoners. You see, on one hand, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to use a term like two-tier, I'm going to use a more posh term, and maybe more soft language, when I will refer to it as selective zero tolerance, which has happened at the moment. You see, a lot of people are concerned that there are too many people out there who like the possessions of other people's houses too much and seem to get away with taking them. There's a lot of people out there who um, are fond of children in an inappropriate way. There are a lot of people out there also who are fond of other people's Rolexes. And there's a lot of people out there who take, um, what I say, sharp pieces of cutlery that they shouldn't have in the street and go out and um, perform a new version of the gentleman's sport sword fencing in a rather inappropriate and rather scary way that no civilized country should have to put up with. But at the same time, and I'm going to have to be very careful about how I say this. People who did riot, and people, of course, who set fire to things, people who broke people's front garden walls up in order to have rocks to throw at police officers, people who set fire to things, people who caused criminal damage. Now, in any civilised society, we wouldn't want people like that, obviously. They are wrong to have done that, 
And, you know, obviously a prison sentence is uh, an appropriate punishment for people like that. But it didn't stop there. There was like observers who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And there were people who tweeted. Now, a lot of the tweets that people did actually give out were maybe inappropriate, maybe a bit inflammatory. But it, uh, you know, what to say, if there was a sort of zero tolerance approach to all crime all over the place, everywhere, with every group, every demographic, every crime, every everything, then of course, you know, no one would mind. Everyone would think, well, good, you know, and the Labour Party, of course, and Keir Starmer would win the hearts and minds of the British public. But the only downside of this is that the bubble or echo chamber or episteme or reality tunnel that he seems to be stuck in is, um, I mean, I've, I've heard other people try to uh, describe his state of mind, to say that um, he lives a great life. And the only reason why you, working class right wing thugs, don't live a great life is because you don't have the same ideals as me. If you only had the same ideals as me, you could live in this globalist utopia. We are now living in a post historical and post cultural world. And we are living in this great cosmopolitan place. And if only you, working class scum out there, could only realise just how lucky you are to be living in this world and didn't have those far right thug views that you have, then maybe you'd be able to live as good a life as me. And if you don't think like the way I demand that you think, then you are nothing more than a defective cog in the system and you therefore must be corrected and recalibrated. That's how I think he thinks. I mean, this is the thing. So what are the implications? I'll tell you what the implications are. A lot of people who are going to end up being banged up for more minor things, just uh, saying hurty words or being in the wrong place at the wrong time or just gesticulating or shouting but not necessarily rioting, are going to be getting these sentences, these fast track sentences. We love to forgive me, my lav mic is hanging out. How unprofessional. Maybe I'll just tuck it away. Yes, so um, the, uh, these, this is going to result in a number of things. Now, it is known and it is common knowledge that there are a lot of um, gangs, if you like, of a certain faith. Um, might as well say it, there are a lot of Muslim gangs in certain prisons running the prisons. And um, as a result of that, if anyone who goes to prison is uh, considered to be one of these so-called far-right thugs, then they are in danger in these prisons, some of these prisons. And this is uh, something that has to be watched out for. Now, what will happen is, I fear that a lot of these people who are going to these prisons might not come out alive. Now, some of them might decide to appease these gangs by converting. Some of the people who do appease these gangs might uh, become radicalised themselves. And when they come out, they might treat all of the members of their family as uh, infidels and stuff like that. Other people who are more resistant to this might just um, adopt the appearance of... Uh, converting um, in order uh, just to not be beaten up, um, but not getting the memo that there's no way out of this. Thinking that, all right, I'll just tell them I am, but when I come out, I'll just say, no, I'm not. Not realizing what the consequences of apostasy is, according to the more radicalized members of that religion. And as a result, this could put them in danger when they come out. The fact that they've also been doxxed, the fact that their mugshots are all over the place and the towns that they come from as well, or all over the place, is going to have knock-on effects to members of their family who were innocent, who weren't there, who didn't do these things, as well as a number of other things. The fallout of this is going to be pretty bad. Um, also, the fallout of uniting two warring tribes in Ireland, the British and the Irish nationalists, um, with the consequences and with the far-reaching implications there's going to be secondary and tertiary and other effects going all the way down which is actually going to um how could i say cause a pressure cooker effect and i dread to think what the outcome of that would be and i actually do worry about that there's also a man who um i shall uh, codename mr lennon you know who i'm talking about the man who is small in stature but big in influence who comes from luton who um, goes by the uh, pseudonym, first name Tommy, but I call him Mr. Lennon because uh, the algorithms will think I'm talking about a member of the Beatles if I do that. Yes, I think that whatever you think of him, good or bad, and me personally, I'm somewhat ambivalent 
uh, about him, but whether you like him or whether you don't, his influence is going to grow as a result of this. And um, if he's made into a martyr, I don't think that the Labour Party or the Starmer administration or the police or any of these people have actually thought of the implications of what this means. Now, the thing is that if it were just that, like they said, these, these rioters are thugs and we're going to deal with them, and they didn't politicise it by using terms like far right, like this, and um, if they also, at the same time, were just as keen to, um, you know, as I say, lock up other people of other demographics who've done very, very heinous things like knives and stuff like that. If there wasn't this juxtaposition that creates the appearance of a two-tier system, right, that they deny exists, if, they, if the public in their tens of millions can see that what is going on. And the problem with that is that they've lost the hearts and minds of people and they've given us the impression that they've declared war on the working classes. This is not a good look. Also, internationally, there'll be many countries around the world and many people from many countries around the world, hundreds of millions of people who will be looking at Britain. And I kind of fear that recently all eyes have been on Britain for all the wrong reasons. And, you know, I would like, personally, I would like it that, all, that this all could stop. I'd like it that all the violence could stop. I mean, I don't, want to, I don't want to see people bringing their sharp pieces of cutlery on the way to, outside, you know, like that in London. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't think it's right that, um, you know, even millionaires in London don't feel safe that they can wear Rolexes anymore in London. I mean, you know, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whatever you come from, whatever your demographic, whatever your age, whatever your income, and it is, it should be that London, which used to have a reputation as being one of the safest mega cities in the Western world, now is losing that reputation. And, you know, with this politicisation of what's going on, with this really rigid-minded administration that um, Britain has at the moment, is pretty scary. So, you know, you can imagine that, like, yeah, a lot of people are going to exodus. A lot, there's going to be a massive exodus out of the UK of all the, how to say, of a lot of people that, you know, that basically anyone who, who really considers the UK economy would realise it's in your best interest to keep them in the country. They would be good for the country. But I fear there's going to be a mass exodus out of there now. And, uh, you know, uh, it does actually worry me what's going to go on. I don't, I just think that, unfortunately, this is the beginning of something that is going to get worse. And, you know, that, that's, my, that's my real concern. I don't want it to come to that. And, um, you know, I would say to people, yeah, you shouldn't do these things. But at the same time, I could be blue in the face saying you shouldn't do these things. But, you know, emotions are emotions. Anger is anger. And a lot of people can't be controlled. And a lot of people will lose control. And it's a shame that this will happen. Because it then would probably create a viable pretext for, you know, how can I say, Starmers, Starm troopers to get even more heavy handed. And if this appears to be applied selectively, it's only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And it's like, it's like I don't know. I would not like to think that um, they are a bunch of evil Machiavelli Machiavellian psychopaths. I would like to think that they are just people who live in some sort of utopian ideological bubble who are just not very good at reading the room. That's what I would like to think. But of course, whether what I like to think and the reality might be at odds with each other. So I kind of wish the UK the best for the people who did leave you know, I don't blame you. But for the people who um, want to stay and fight, um, you know, to um, restore some sort of cultural order into the UK, if you like, to, to bring it back to the way it was, um, you know, before, how can I say, before the revolution, I think that's a tall order at this point. You know, I really do. Now, according to Rafe Hadel Manku of the New, Cultural, New Culture Forum, he says, and um, I... You know, I've seen him quite a few times um, on interviews. He's spoken about this uh, to Peter Whittle on the New Culture Forum. He's spoken about this on Talk TV and GB News. And he says that he thinks that Britain is in a post-revolutionary state. It went through some sort of bloodless coup uh, when Tony Blair came in, changed the institutions, changed the whole cultural makeup of the UK, as well as its institutions, as well as its systems and all of that. And um, this has basically been a bloodless revolution 
And, um, and now we are in post-revolutionary times, and this is uh, the outcome of it. Now that, um, I personally think, is really concerning. Can Britain actually make it, bring itself back from this? I don't know. Uh, it does mean, though, there's a few turbulent years ahead. And, um, you know, we can only hope it's not going to be civil war. But at the moment, I see the UK in a state of cold civil war, if I be honest. That's what I see. Um, and, uh, you know, I just wish everyone the best. And when it comes to, as I say, when it comes to people of other countries and other cultures, the fact is that if, if I'd have gone back in time and I go back to my, myself in the, my 20s and 30s and I say to that younger version of Niall out there, in the future, you've got to be careful because they'll try to make you to be far right. Uh, that younger version would have either laughed at me and said, no, that's not going to happen, or would be scared and think, oh, shit, that future looks really bad. Oh, well, how come you haven't lost your mind over it? Oh, don't I, he'd say. You know? uh, so this is, what we'd be, uh, this is what the conversation would be like. So anyway, um, I want to move on to a few other subjects because um, I like to zoom out, look at the bigger picture and um, you know, unfold. So I thought this thing the other day, hippies versus heads. As I look like an old hippie, all right, why aren't I on the side of Extinction Rebellion? Why am I not on the side of all the lefties? And why am I, um, why do I appear to be, you know, politically on a different side to all these people? And the reason why is because um, hippies versus heads. You see, the hippies used to be, oh, this trip is great. You've got to have this trip. The heads, on the other hand, were, don't lay your trip on other people. That was the difference. Now, in the context of the 1960s, they were talking about their LSD experiences, but the trip also has a different meaning, i.e., sorry, bite it, i.e., put my teeth in, your ideological position. Your ideological position could be, oh, if only everyone thought like me, they could be on my trip with me. And the thing that I do that does concern me at the moment is that we have uh, an establishment class now who unfortunately are like that. They like the old counterculture, but like the old counterculture has somehow become orthodox, somehow become the establishment culture, and they didn't even notice it, where a lot of the old pop stars, with, uh, how can I say, a very few exception, like uh, I, can, I can basically count them on the fingers of one hand. There's Jenny Bellstar, there's Right Said Fred, Morrissey, and that's about it as far as I can say. The rest of them, Rage Against the Machine became Rage For the Machine, um, the Kaiser Chiefs became the Pfizer Chiefs, and Dave Grohl might as well rename himself Dave Pfizer at this point. You know, so we know that a lot of the, how to say, a lot of the pop stars. Even I think um, even uh, Rod Stewart got booed for showing a picture of Zelensky recently in one of his uh, concerts. So we know that a lot of the rock stars become establishment. The, the old counterculture seems to have become a new bourgeois bohemian um, replacement of the old boy network. And this is the issue that I'm dealing with at the moment. Somehow, there are a lot of hippies gone wrong. But the heads are the people who realise that the ideological possession of your position, who would say, don't lay your trip on other people. And that goes for ideologies, as well as what you do with the state of your mind, you see. And so they're the people who would be resistant to our ideological possession. But likewise, also, um, I'm just as resistant to the far right. I'm just as resistant to the far right because I knew they were bad too. But I'm equally as resistant to the far left. I think that I do not want to be any kind of extremist at all. But the trouble is, with this Orwellian distortion of reality that is going on at the moment, we're dealing with a situation where being a moderate is like a form of extremism. How the hell they done that? I don't know, but there you go. Enough gaslighting, I suppose. Right, I've just got to go have a butchers at my notes because um, I actually wrote some notes down here because I wanted to have a few bullet points. Let me see. Yes, here we go. I wanted also to talk about when I was at school. I learned something about the creep of totalitarian systems by being at a naughty boys boarding school for maladjusted kids. Now the whole working class are maladjusted kids according to Keir Starmer, and Keir Starmer is like the head of care staff at my old boarding school. And that's basically what it is. He brought in a grade system, which was like a social credit score that would be updated every week. Now, when I first went to the school, it was actually before the head of care staff joined. 
Then he come along and he changed the system. Rather than getting zero, one or two points in your classroom, being able to get a maximum of 28 points in the classroom, which make you a good boy. And I was actually able to do that right before this, his new social credit score or grade system came in. Uh, then of course, he brought in the grade system. And it basically meant that you were marked on three or four or five different things in your attitude to work, your competence, your interest, all that. And you'd be marked by a much more complex system, which actually made me go down the ranks. Right? And then, of course, you'd be marked by a lot of other things by all your teachers and all the house staff. You were monitored and you were marked all the time. And then there was this grade system. Now, if you were goody two-shoes, um, you got an A grade. If you were super goody two-shoes, creep, crawl, creep, bum licky, you got an A+. And what I noticed about a couple of the kids who were A+, is that they were not actually good people. They were just highly manipulative and knew how to appear to be good. They'd make the ideal virtue signalers, if you like. They were the ones who got the highest grades. Right, this is what I noticed. Where a lot of the people who just wanted to be themselves and you know, just be normal, whatever, would get B grades. So I was often a B grade, which basically meant I was not rewarded handsomely, but I was also likewise not punished too much. Then I went on work experience. And the problem with going on work experience, well, uh, the boss of the company was given a form that they had to tick boxes in and then it would be reinterpreted into the school grading stroke social credit system. And he, he thought I was all right. He never thought I was bad. He never thought I was that incompetent. He was happy to have me there, the boss of this uh, place where I was working. But then because it fell below a certain threshold, it was, it was basically one week interpreted as a C grade according to this, which basically meant after school, I weren't allowed to choose my activities and they would choose them for me and they would choose my least favorite activity. And this turned out to be somewhat of an issue because I wasn't punished or told that I was bad at what I did by the, um, you know, by, by the people at the work experience, but it was interpreted into a punishment when I was at school. The school itself was divided into four quadrants and we had to be proud to be part of our house, right? And that was the thing. And I remember one day I said, I, I'm sick of being a part of a house. I'm sick of being a letter on a grade system. I don't want to be a brick with a letter on it. I want to be a real human being. This was heresy. I was showing signs of thinking like an individual and I was punished for that. It was like I was an insurrectionist or a, a revolutionary. How, how dare I have the temerity or the audacity to think like this, God. And that was it. I knew I was a thought criminal before I even left school. Uh, I'm proud of that actually, <laughs> so there you go. So this is um, something I felt that I really had um, to you know, mention because you know, individualism versus collectivism is a bit of a problem. There's also an issue as well that I want to talk about too, right? Uh, the phrase ideological possession has been put into the language by Jordan Peterson. Now, a lot of people like him, a lot of people don't. Nevertheless, he did come up with the phrase ideological possession to mean that someone who is literally possessed by a set of ideas and cannot think for themselves and become a very hardline zealot when it comes to these ideas, whether you're left wing, whether you're right wing, whether you're a member of a religion, whether you're, you're very rigid in the way that you think. And I think ideological possession will be in the future a, uh, a mental illness. It will be considered to be a mental illness or a personality disorder. But as yet, it is not. But what will happen, I think, is that as a result of all this far lefty, post-woke, totalitarian, dystopian stuff which is going on in the West, which, of course, you know, won't last forever, because when it gets that blatant, it has a finite life, and we know that. And as we're not the Chinese, um, or we're not the, the Soviet Russians or anything like that, we are European individualists, um, a system like that ain't going to wash with the people, because enough people are going to understand that, no, this is not for us. Our history, our culture, our heritage, our genetic memory, going right away back thousands of years, forbids us from going down this road. So it has got a finite life and it won't last forever. But once it is overthrown, which I think it will be, it may take anything between 
five years to 50 years for it to be overthrown. But when it is overthrown, I reckon then people will look back and they'll realize, well, how did this happen? And they'll, they'll look at the literature by then, which will become more, there'll be more of it about ideological possession and the, and maybe there's a link between ideological possession and autism. And maybe there's a link between ideological possession and rigidity of mind. Maybe there'll be, uh, you know, they'll be able to make links between ideological possession and maybe, I don't know what you call it, moderate sociopathy, something like that. And maybe they will be able to come up with a test one day to find out whether people are prone to ideological possession or not. And maybe um, the world will go more in the favour of free thinking, highly individualistic, highly nuanced thinkers at that point in the future. This is, um, you know, the thing. So, you know, you, you know, you can talk to me about anything and I will give you a highly nuanced response about everything because that's what I'm like. Right? Now, I don't desire power. That's the issue, you see. And you will find that people who are uh, very highly nuanced in the way they think are less likely to desire power over other people. Maybe because being highly nuanced in the way you think makes you realise what the consequences of power is. And this might be something that's a very difficult circle to square or square to circle or however it goes for the human condition in general. Maybe this is something that we can't, you know, it's going to be extremely difficult for us to find a solution to. But I suppose we'll just have to see how it goes. At the moment though, what I do see is um, Carl Benjamin pointed this out on Lotus Eaters. He thinks the problem that we have at the moment is um, we have a, a 90 IQ government, right? A 90 IQ government. They're not very bright. You know, you've got, uh, what's his name? David Lammy, who uh, thinks that uh, when, when asked which Mary was um, you know, awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in the late 19th century, early 20th century for her work in chemistry, Instead of saying Marie Curie, he said Marie Antoinette, right? When asked about who came after Henry VIII, he said Henry VII. Now, for those of you who know, uh, those of you who know uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, what happened there was that um, Zaphod Beeblebrox, his dad was Zaphod Beeblebrox II and his granddad was Zaphod Beeblebrox III. And people said, huh, that doesn't make sense. How come that happened? Because there was an accident with a contraceptive and a time machine. Well, David Lammy thinks that happened to the royal family. <laughs> so there you go, right? And, and he even said in an interview on a panel once, right, that... Uh, that when we won the, the, the war, when we won the Second World War, we were saving the European project. He meant the European Union, right? Uh, which, I don't know, man. I mean, the only European project at that time was flipping Hitler's. Britain was trying to save itself. So, you know, that is so duncy, isn't it? Right? And of course, at the moment as well, as you know, um, what's her name now? Jess Phillips and Yvette Cooper, Mrs. Balls. They want to bring in this uh, extreme misogyny bill, which they want to actually equate misogyny with terrorism. Now, you know why they're doing this, right? It's because of Andrew Tate videos. Now, yeah, Andrew Tate's somewhat of a dubious character. I mean, I'll be the first to say that, you know. He reminds me of what I would call the second hardest kid in the school with rich parents. You know, look at my bling, that sort of thing. But she's not looking at why. Oh, why are boys looking at people like Andrew Tate? Uh, what causes to happen? You know, I've seen the link between man-hating feminism and the feelings of boys becoming disenfranchised because, you know, because of this. Uh, boys can't even approach girls anymore because uh, they've been told they're misogynists. And everything they do is misogynistic. And this has been going on since the mid-2000s when feminism, you know, when that, that kind of said, that particular wave of feminism turned pretty toxic. And boys have been told for years that masculinity is to toxic. And this is stupid. Because, you know, masculinity and femininity in the human condition are natural. They're complementary opposites and are necessary. Um, they don't have to be toxic. But both can be toxic and both cannot be. And this is the thing that, you know, to me is just so stupid. Jess Phillips, I saw her on um, YouTube on a panel where the, the, in, in the Commons where... They were talking about, you know, men's issues, men's health, men's mental health and stuff like that. And she was just laughing, like, you know, dismissing it, laughing, like, because she was going through this pro-feminist thing at the time. 
And now her and Yvette Cooper coming out and saying that they want to put, you know, to, to decide that if boys are being slightly male chauvinist, that the teachers must report them. So they must um, be sent to prevent, which is this quango, I believe it is, that's supposed to prevent terrorism. They want to say that extreme misogyny is like terrorism, but it won't be extreme misogyny, will it? It'll just be working class banter. So, you know, I mean, uh, have they changed the meanings of things in a dictionary? Because do, they don't seem very bright to me. None of these people seem very bright to me. I think, right, that um, when it comes down to it, there isn't, um, you know, is there some sort of uh, uh, evil matriarchy running the world and um, the, the dissidents are the men? And as a result, these dissident freedom fighter men need to overthrow the... Uh, I don't know what you call it, the, the totalitarian regime of women, so they're using terrorist methods to do it. I didn't think that misogyny in the dictionary meant anything like that, so to equate it with terrorism is ridiculous. And then of course, you know, got Starmer in there, because the thing about him is that he's as dull as John Major or Arthur Dent, he's remarkably unremarkable, but as a person, right, that's the thing. And, uh, you know, but he also, you know, he's been talking extremely tough now. Rigidity of mind like you wouldn't believe. I mean, my God, no one, you know, with that level of rigidity of mind should, should have power. I'm sorry. Someone who's completely non-negotiable, who, you know, just uh, gives a broad brush and says, all of you, what I call it, 25 to 30 million Brits who are from working class backgrounds, you're all far right now, because we said so. And it's non-negotiable and you can't have a debate with us about it because you're all far right and your working class banter and your slang and your ways are all wrong. You are all um, reject quality units within our perfect world and you must conform to the way we want you to conform to or you're all bother boot wearing facial tattooed skinhead gammon barely civilized subhuman savages. I mean what the fuck? Oh, God, I'll tell you what, I've got to give them all dunces caps, right? Because as far as I know, political satire is still legal. You know, that's the thing, so why not? Give them dunces caps. And so, you know, this is what I mean. So to sum up, none of us want riots. None of us want the UK to go to shit. None of us want any of this. But, you know, if we had some leaders that were capable of actually engaging with the public to say, look, we're trying to warn you about something here. You got to listen to us. If we said, according to the social contract of the UK, you're supposed to serve us, we elect you to serve us. It's not the other way around. Um, uh, we're trying to warn you. There are plenty of people from the working classes who are intellectually astute, who are erudite, who are sophisticated in the way they think, who are capable of argumentation, who are like this because they've taught themselves how to be like this. I spent the last decade of my life on the internet learning about argumentation, learning about logical fallacies, learning how to be more nuanced in my way that I think. And I can't be the only person out there who's done this. I've gone out of my way to do this, you know? Not to incite stupidity or violence or any of that stuff. No, I'm not into that. I can look and I say, I can see what the fallout of what's happened recently could be and I think it could actually be really bad. Now, I don't want that to happen. But, you know, it's not a question of what I want. I think that, you know, he's playing a very dangerous game. And when I say he's playing a dangerous game, I honestly don't know. Is it because he's dense? Or is it because he really doesn't care and he actually is malevolent? Now, you'd hope, wouldn't you, that our leaders are maybe intend to be benevolent, but are a little bit thick, you'd hope that, wouldn't you? But it's very hard to hope that at the moment. And if it was possible to have some clear communication with them, without them saying things to us that are clearly lies, I mean, you know, when you've got, as I say, a 90 IQ government just lying to your face, saying, there isn't this, no, you're all mistaken, and they're saying, you're all far right, there is no two-tier policing. I mean, you know, I would like to believe that Keir Starmer really believes what he says and just has bad advisers. But I'm finding it hard to believe that, you know? 
that's what I mean. I'm finding it very hard to believe that that's the case. So there you go. Also, last thing before I leave, what's his name? Paz49, ex-army Paz49. He's someone I follow. He's an ex-prison officer, an ex-military serviceman. And he said in one of his videos that a lot of the squaddies um, in this coming November Remembrance uh, Sunday or Armistice Day are going to be at the Cenotaph when the Prime Minister is going to be there. And they are planning to do an about turn and turn their back on him as a gesture. Now, I don't know. I've had this not confirmed to me by anyone else except Paz49. So I'm not saying that this is news as such, fake or real. But what I am saying is that a lot of the people who didn't riot, a lot of the people who actually protested legitimately, which the media has done a blackout of all over Britain, because they haven't reported on the peaceful protests when it came to all of this, the, the patriots. They've, they've basically got rid of all of that and only focused on the riots. Now, me being someone who follows a lot of different people on YouTube from a lot of different political persuasions, I've seen evidence that, uh, from people who have been interviewed that a lot of ex-army servicemen were on those marches. And unlike the police, which pretty much are, you know, are going to say the, the tools of the state these days, the, um, the squaddies and a lot of people in the army are loyal to the king and the crown, not the government. And this is what you have to bear in mind. They are basically fight for king and country, not prime minister and country, not parliament and country, but king and country. They're loyal to the crown. They were loyal to the queen when she was alive. And as far as they are concerned, you know, the, the, the monarch is the commander in chief. Now, whatever you think of Charlie boy, right? Whatever you think of him, the fact is that the military, if they're not happy, with Keir Starmer, and they do something like that, a public display of their disapproval to him, then, you know, again, that's, that's bloodless. I wouldn't be asking for them to do a coup or anything like that. But if they were to, to actually demonstrate their disdain for him, that message would go across. They would have, eventually, to be a vote of no confidence in that man, and something would have to be done. Because, as I say, the squaddies, if Britain had martial law now, instead of the police, if it, had the, if it had the army, one thing is that if I were there and suddenly we had uh, martial law, you know what I'd be doing? I'd be inviting the squaddies in when they're off duty in my house for a cup of tea. That's what I'd be doing. And I'd be asking them questions. How do you feel about this? Because they're different from the police in the sense that when they're off duty, they're just off duty. Now, of course, when they're on duty, if you're on the wrong side of it, or you met wrong and it was a squaddy or whatever, you'd have issues. But generally speaking, when they're off duty, they're off duty. They'd be much easier to get to know and they'd be much easier to, you know, and if you said to them that, you know, you are, we, you are supposed to be our protectors, you know, I take it you're not at war with us. You're supposed to be our protectors. You're supposed to be loyal to the crown above the government. Um, you know, and then you invite them in for a cup of tea and just sit down, tell us your life story and all of that, they would have a much different attitude to the police. And so I, I see there's a possibility that something could change for the better there. And for the people, and there are a lot of people who say, no, I'm not leaving. Oh, anyone who leaves, why do they want to do that? You can't run away from your problems. And a lot of English people are thinking like that. And then there's a lot of other English people out there thinking, oh, there's nowhere to go. And then there's the expats who've gone. They think, well, huh, found somewhere to go. Let's hope, uh, let's hope they don't extradite me back for, uh, for what I say, for having the wrong sense of humour. And maybe they make that a crime next, you never know, do you? Right. But of course, uh, the thing is, right, that whatever happens and whatever happens in the future, for the people who are there and for the people who are not there, you know, it is where I came from. Enough of my heart is there. I do miss the countryside there too. Yes, I'm on a tropical beach. Yes, it's a very exotic looking location, you know. However, you know, I do miss the English countryside and, um, and I do miss uh, certain things about it. I do miss the changing seasons. I miss Avebury, you know, I miss Devon. There's a lot I miss about that. And, um, you know, I miss uh, the end of winter into the beginning of spring. I miss the summertime. I miss the autumn. Don't particularly like the winter. I like to get out during that time, of course. But, but, but you know, as I say, I do 
miss certain aspects of the UK. I don't hate it and I um, wish it well. And I hope, I really do hope, right, that, you know, how can I say, it gets out of this mess at some point and turns around and things stop getting worse and start getting better. And it really needs to happen, doesn't it? Anyway, this video has been quite long, so forgive me for that. Um, I shall uh, leave it at that then. See you later, alligator. See you soon. Baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.